I'm Taro Durizumi. I would like to talk about analyzing neural population dynamics. Um, let me begin with the classical examples of neural information coding. Uh, the first example is from primary visual cortex. In the famous experiment by Hubert and Wiesel, Nobel Prize winning experiment, they uh, characterize how um, neurons in the visual cortex respond to the oriented bars, uh, ori an oriented bar on the screen. If the orientation is aligned to the preferred direction of a neuron, this neuron emits a lot of action potentials. But if the, uh, the bar is tilted away from the preferred orientation, there is almost no response. So you can characterize this neuron's response by plotting the firing rate, the number of action potentials emitted per second, uh, as a function of the orientation of a bar. If uh, a bar is oriented along the preferred direction of a cell, then the response is high. And when the uh, stimulus bar is tilted away from the preferred orientation, then the response decreases. Here's another example from the motor cortex. Um, and uh, neurons in the motor cortex respond to arm reaching direction. Here is a recording from Behaving Monkey. And uh, uh, this cell, for example, respond when uh, the monkey's arm is reaching toward this direction. And uh, this neuron doesn't fire a lot when the arm is reaching toward this zero degree direction. Uh, again, you can characterize this neuron's response, uh, so-called tuning curve, by plotting the firing rate as a function of the reaching direction. Um, when the arm is reaching to the preferred direction of the cell, the, the response is high, and when the direction is away from that, the response decreases. So by looking at this uh, tuning response, tuning curve, or the response of the cell, uh, you can tell what kind of stimulus is in the environment, like orientation of the bar or uh, arm reaching direction. But obviously, in the brain, uh, neurons are not operating in isolation, but uh, uh, rather active cohesively. Um, and uh, here is a zoom out view of the cortical activity. Um, and you can see many neurons, many brain areas are activated together. Um, this is a more zoom in view. Uh, and at the single cell resolution, you can see that multiple neurons um, co-active together. And uh, characterizing such um, neural population dynamics, um, activity of a population of neurons uh, becomes even more important um, thanks to modern techniques uh, of recording neurons from recording neurons. And uh, for example, this is a whole brain imaging by light sheet microscopy. You can record the entire neuron uh, in the brain, uh, neurons in the brain in a larval zebrafish. Um, so this is a, a massive number of neurons operating together. And uh, there are also techniques uh, with a high resolution electrophysiology, like neural pixels. And uh, sometimes um, you can manipulate uh, population of activity of neural population to um, perturb the memory in mice. And uh, um, you can record from a population of neural activity to move a robot arm in a brain machine interface. Um, in these examples, um, you can have an access to an activity of a population of neurons and uh, characterizing uh, their activity is important. And uh, how to characterize neural population dynamics? Um, often models are important. 
And neural network models are useful for characterizing, predicting, controlling neural population dynamics. There are multiple ways, multiple directions uh, of modeling a population of neurons. Um, one approach is uh, using deterministic models. And uh, here I would like to talk about um, using deterministic, characterizing your population dynamics using a deterministic model, because arguably it's simpler than stochastic neural models, and uh, it can still capture some uh, essential features of neural population dynamics. So let me focus here about deterministic neurons. And uh, the simplest way to characterize a uh, simple model is a linear neural network model. So in, in this case, uh, we can characterize a change in neural activity R i t is a firing rate of neuro i at time t, and this is a time derivative uh, uh, of that. And this is determined by three terms. The first term is a, the decay term, which means that in the absence of input to a neuron, the, the activity decays back down to the baseline, in this case, which is zero. There are two kinds of inputs synaptic inputs and external input. The, this term uh, is uh, input from nearby neurons. So if you look at uh, neural I, which, whose firing rate is Ri, it receives input from nearby neurons, for example, from neuron J. And uh, what's the input from neuron J? It's the firing rate of this neuron J, Rj, times the synaptic weight wij from neuron j to i. So this particular term is a synaptic input from neuron j and if you sum from all neurons around then this is the total synaptic input to neuron i. The third term is external input to neuron i which is uh, not explicitly modeled with the, the network here. So how do we um, solve this linear neural population dynamics? Um, the idea um, is to use the eigenmode decomp eigenvalue decompositions that you've learned in the linear algebra. Let me explain that. Um, so again, this is the linear neural population dynamics um, and uh, more schematically, we can represent the interactions in this way. Um, here is the activity of neuron J, here is the new activity of neuron I, and their um, dynamics are coupled by uh, the interaction um, due to synaptic strength Wij. So here multiple neurons are interacting with each other and uh, it's a little bit harder to solve. Um, and the way to solve it is by decomposing, um, by applying the coordinate transformation so that the, you can decompose dynamics into eigenmodes. So if you apply um, the coordinate transformation, then you can find a nice coordinate where um, eigenmodes are decoupled. Um, so if you apply the coordinate transformation, uh, you can describe the neural activity in terms of eigenmode. The RI, RA tilde is the eighth eigenmode of uh, neural activity. And the change in that is described again by three terms. Uh, here's the decay term, here's the external input. But uh, um, after this coordinate transformation, the, the interaction is described by with the eigenmode, eighth eigenmode alone. Um, so you can, uh, by the way, this W A tilde is the eigenvalue, is an eigenvalue of this eigen, uh, of this synaptic weight matrix W. 
So more schematically, you can uh, depict the dynamics like this. In the original dynamics, neurons are interacting with each other, but by applying the right coordinate transformation, now the eigen mode A is interacting only with itself, with the uh, interaction strength given by the eigenvar eighth eigenvalue of this uh, weight matrix. So, um, by applying, so basically to solve this linear neurodynamics, here it's described in a um, vector and vector form. Um, to solve this, what you have to do is first apply a coordinate transformation, solve individual eigenmodes um, separately, and apply coordinate transformation back. Um, and uh, you can write down the solution in a concise form where the result, the solution of the activity is uh, this impulse response function G convolved with the external input. And uh, this G is uh, exactly what I have described. Um, this P is the, uh, P inverse is the inverse eigenvectors of the weight matrix. This W tilde is the eigenvalues of the weight matrix. So what this impulse response function tells is um, to solve the neurodynamics. First, you apply a coordinate transformation to convert neuron bases into eigenmode bases. Then uh, individual eigenmode are, um, can be solved separately so that a blue eigenmode evolves like this, red eigenmode evolves like this. Uh, each of them are a simple exponential uh, decay of, um, uh, in, in its dynamics. And uh, finally, you can apply a coordinate transformation back from eigenmodes to neuron bases. That's this uh, multiplication P. So by simply applying this, you can solve the dynamics. What it means is that the input ij t prime to neuron j at time t prime increases neural, uh, future neural activity ri at time t by this amount. The amount is simply computed by the external input times the impulse response function, regardless of other inputs. This is the reminiscent feature of the linear dynamics. Um, suppose you have input input one that cause uh, drives output uh, one, input two that drives the output by uh, output two. What happens if two inputs are presented together? You can simply sum the individual output response, output one plus output two, uh, in this to in uh, as a response to the total input uh, input one plus input two. So um, this formula just implements that relationship. So um, you can understand a linear network as an input output system. The input external input i is provided to the network. The network has the impulse response function G and emits the output R. And this R is G convolved with the input. And every input is summed uh, and multiplied with the G to predict the response. So, so far, um, I've been talking about the general weight matrix W without specifying uh, the form. But uh, let's think about a um, simple uh, but intuitive example. Uh, we can model the heterogeneity in neurons by uh, using random weight matrix. 
Um, the idea is that there are many synaptic weights uh, connecting neurons and uh, they are not very uniform. Some synapses are strong, some synapses are weak. Um, so the easiest way to model such heterogeneity in the interaction strength is to assume that this dub synaptic weight Wij is drawn randomly from some distribution. In this case, uh, we use a simple Gaussian distribution with a mean zero and the variance g square over n. So if you plot the, the histogram of the, the synaptic weights, it, this is a Gaussian distributed with a zero mean and the standard deviation of g over square root of n. Um, this um, one over n factor is to make sure that the resulting neural population dynamics is uh, invariant to the network size n. n is the number of neurons in for large n. Um, and I told you um, the eigenvalues of this synaptic weight matrix can characterize neural neuro population dynamics because um, once you make a coordinate transformation, individual eigenmodes just exponentially evolves uh, with the um, eigenvalue component. Um, exponential of this eigenvalue times the time passed. So um, it's important to characterize the eigenvalues of this random weight matrix. And uh, in this case, we can simply apply the known result. Jerko's circular law of eigenvalues uh, says that um, it says that the eigenvalues of this weight matrix is uniformly distributed uh, in this disk of radius g and it's centered at zero. Um, this, this axis is the real value of eigenvalue, real part of the eigenvalue. The vertical axis is the imaginary part of the eigenvalue. And, uh, and the eigenvalues distributed in this circle. Um, so we can immediately know um, there are heterogeneity neurons, some, um, some neurons, uh, sorry, some eigenmode decays uh, very uh, quickly, some eigenmodes decays very uh, slowly. Some are oscillating fast, some are oscillating slow. Um, so here's a numerical simulation, computer simulation of linear neurodynamics. Um, and uh, here this W is again a uh, random matrix with the Gaussian elements. So in this simulation, the input is zero, up to this time, and then the pulse of a pulse of input is uh, injected to this population, and again back to zero. And uh, neurons respond to this input in a heterogeneous manner. Some neurons respond uh, by a small amount. Some neurons respond a lot and also how they, uh, the transient dynamics are different for each neurons. Um, and this is characterized by basically uh, the different eigen uh, values. Um, there are some components decaying quickly, some components decaying slowly, some components oscillating, some components not oscillating. Um, so, so far we have modeled linear population dynamics, but uh, our real neural networks, simple input output systems, because uh, for linear, linear uh, neurons, uh, we can solve it as a input output system. Obviously, the, the biological neurons are not uh, pure, uh, not completely linear. Uh, it 
has some nonlinear features. It does not respond if the input is too small. It doesn't, it, uh, the response saturate if the input is too large. Um, so more realistically, the change in the firing rate can be described by, um, here's a decay term, but with some nonlinearity f. Um, in the previous example, we've used uh, a linear function f, but um, the f can be, uh, would more naturally have some saturation, this lower saturation at zero or and uh, upper saturation at some point. So uh, what happens if we use some nonlinear function uh, like this? Here's a numerical simulation using the same external input pulse. Um, again, the neurons respond to this external input, but what's notice, the most noticeable difference is that in this case, neurons uh, are active even in the absence of external input, and they um, should exhibit rather irregular dynamics uh, without the external input. So some neurons are going down, some neurons are going up. And uh, that's the same when the external input uh, decays back down to zero. There is still ongoing uh, irregular pop neural population dynamics. So neurons are spontaneously active even in the absence of external input. So how do we analyze uh, this kind of nonlinear neural population dynamics? Arguably, this is a, a pretty complicated system because there are many neurons and uh, each of them has, uh, is a nonlinear um, component. So, um, Generally speaking, it's hard to solve, but uh, uh, in a special case, this is solvable. And I would like to talk about this uh, special case. Um, so this is the equation that I've already introduced to you, uh, except that, you know, uh, I previously write it, uh, wrote that um, um, dr, dt is uh, some decay term plus this uh, nonlinear input component like this. Um, but now uh, I just moved this um, decay term to the left hand side and say it's a, a one plus d dt times r equals this uh, nonlinear term f. Um, I just uh, simply wrote this ddt as uh, this partial t. But the, this is the same equation um, that I've introduced to you before. Um, so this is the equation for the neurodynamics and this h is the input to the system. For the simplicity I omitted the external input here but uh, you, you can plug that in, um, I just simple, I took the simple case with no external input. Um, and uh, we can use the mean field theory developed by Sampolinsky et al. Um, to solve this system. And the, basically the, um, the result is that this input H approaches a Gaussian uh, variable for large network. Um, I don't have time to give a proof, but intuitively this is a, a sum of many almost independent terms. Um, and uh, if you sum uh, many almost independent terms um, by the central limit theorem, H will be Gaussian distributed. So that, um, you know, to characterize the input to neurons, basically we can just characterize the mean and the variance of this input H. 
So um, first we compute what's the mean of H. Uh, this E of W means expectation over the synaptic weights, random synaptic weights. Um, so just we can just plug in the definition of H here and uh, here's the description. Um, now uh, we have to take the average of W times R. The point is that the firing rate R is determined by many, many synapses. And the contribution of one synapse WIJ on this RJ is small. So um, this WIJ is almost independent, uh, uncorrelated with this RJ. So approximately for large network, you can uh, separate, separately take the average to this WIJ and RJ. Now, uh, by definition, this WIJ has mean zero. So the, because this part is zero, the mean of the input is zero. Um, the next thing we compute is the variance of H um, and the, the correlation of the H, of the covariance of the H. Um, this can be computed in a very similar way. Just plug in this uh, definition of HIT and HIT prime. Here's the expression. Now we have to take the average of WIJ, WIK and Rj times Rk. Again, the same arguments, we make the same arguments. This Rj and Rk are uh, driven by many, many synapses. And the contribution of just two of them, Wij and Wik, uh, is negligibly small. So that you can separately take the average um, to a good approximation in a large network. Um, so you can separately take the average uh, for this component and, and this part. And uh, um, by the definition, um, Wij and Wik are uh, independent if I is, uh, sorry, if J is different from K. This has a, a value only when uh, J is equal to K. And in this case, the variance of the, the synaptic weight Wij is N, a G square over N. So we can just plug this in um, and get re this result, uh, G, G square over N factor here. And uh, um, now the average over Rj, Rjt and Rjt prime does not depend on specific index j anymore because uh, we took the average. So we can remove this sum uh, and the one over n factor to get this simple form. So uh, with this approach, uh, we can, um, in this mean field theory, we said that for large network, H is Gaussian distributed, and we can characterize it with the mean and the covariance, uh, and they are derived here. So finally, uh, we just defined um, this factor, the output covariance as C, um, and uh, we will compute this C. Uh, note that H is Gaussian distributed, with the mean zero, here the mean is zero, and the covariance uh, g squared times this factor, and this factor we defined as c. So h is Gaussian distributed with the zero mean and the covariance g squared times c. So now we want to uh, derive the closed form equation um, for this, this C. Um, basically, um, here I just copy this equation, one plus 
derivative of t uh, of r i is f of h i um, at, at time t. And the same thing for another dif uh, different time t prime, r i t prime of f of h i t prime. And now we multiply them. We multiply this uh, two of them, one plus delta t, uh, one plus t prime, r i t, r i t prime is f of h i t, f h i t prime. Now um, we can just take the average of uh, both hand size here's the expectation here's an expectation right and uh, this equation is just this final form and uh, because uh, you know this is by definition c so the dynamics of c is given by this factor but uh, uh, importantly, H is Gaussian distributed, and the distribution of this H is directly characterized by the function of C, uh, by a function of C. So this right-hand side is a, C, a function of G squared times C. So this is a closed form equation because the dynamics of C is given by a, by a function of C. Right, and uh, what's the significance of this equation? Uh, we originally started uh, with a many-body problem um, that there are many neurons, many nonlinear neurons. Sorry, uh, many nonlinear neurons, uh, and they are coupled nonlinear dynamics. But in the final form, this is reduces down to one-body problem. There are no more multiple neurons. There is um, only uh, dynamical dynamics of C. The dynamics of C is given by C, right? So this is already a one-body problem. Um, how to how to solve this uh, one-body uh, nonlinear equation will be a separate lecture. But uh, um, by solving this one-body equation, we will know a lot of. Uh, um, properties of the nonlinear dynamics. Um, for example, uh, by solving that equation, we will know irregular dynamics emerge if the coupling scale G is greater than threshold. So note that um, in the linear dynamics, there is no spontaneous activity. Without input, the activity is zero. But uh, for uh, nonlinear dynamics, there can be irregular uh, spontaneous activity. This happens uh, when synapses are strong enough. Um, and so by controlling G and making synapses larger, there um, at some point, this irregular spontaneous ac activity emerges. Um, and you can characterize what is the nature of this uh, irregular activity. In this case, this irregular dynamics is due to high dimensional chaos. And you can uh, compute system properties like the autocorrelation function of this neural activity and uh, the maximum Lyapunov exponent, which is positive because this is chaos um, from the derived equation, uh, equation derived for this C. So um, what I would like to tell is that for linear neurons, it, the dynamics can be characterized as an input-output system. But uh, for nonlinear neurons, it's uh, no more the case. Um, here is the input, here is an output, but uh, there's rich autonomous dynamics going on within the system and the, the 
output depends on the interaction of the external input I and this autonomous dynamics generated by this population of neurons. The final part, I would just briefly introduce um, the properties of this uh, complex ongoing dynamics and potentially how it is good for, for information processing. One um, possible benefit is that the system can be sensitive, highly sensitive to input at the edge of the chaos. Um, so in this setup, um, we consider again randomly connected population of neurons and apply some external input to this population and ask uh, by observing the activity of neurons how accurately we can estimate the, the input, external input provided, right? Um, so this is the information decoding problem and we can characterize this decoding error. Uh, what's, the, what's the accuracy of estimating the input provided to the neurons? Um, that's this vertical axis and as a function of the synaptic scale G. So if this G is small, um, the neuron, neuron activity doesn't hit the saturation limit. So it's essentially a linear dynamics here. Um, and if G is uh, significantly uh, larger than a threshold, then as I told you, uh, irregular chaotic spontaneous dynamics emerge. So this is a chaotic, nonlinear regime. Um, and uh, this borderline, in this case one, this is called so-called so the edge of chaos. And what this figure shows is that the decoding error is minimized at the edge of chaos because the system is very sensitive to the external input there. Another way to utilize spontaneous neural population dynamics is to use the spontaneous activity traces of neurons to compose uh, target dynamical trajectories. So in this example, they uh, use nonlinear uh, coupled neurodynamics. And in this case, there is a feedback uh, circuit so that the uh, spontaneous dynamics is not chaos, but uh, still produces uh, rich spontaneous activity like that. This is individual neuron traces, which is uh, spontaneously generated. And in this example, they use these uh, neural activity trajectories uh, to compose uh, target trajectories. In, in this case, the target is to reproduce uh, motion capture uh, data um, of humans, human walking and human running and the uh, recursive risk square algorithm is used to minimize the output of the network, uh, which is a linear sum of these neural activity and the target um, motion capture joint position. And uh, after learning these readout weights, they can reproduce human uh, walking and running postures. So in summary, um, I, I told you that neurons in the brain are interacting with each other and modeling these interactions and characterizing the resulting dynamics are crucial to understanding uh, brain functions. Uh, we reviewed uh, ways to model neural population dynamics. Uh, the first um, example is a linear neural dynamics, which is solvable. The eigenvalue decomposition and the impulse response function were used to characterize the network's uh, input-output mapping. And then I, um, I explained that heterogeneity in the neural interactions can be modeled using a, a random synaptic weight matrix. The circular law of eigenvalues for random weight matrix characterized how a variety of neural responses emerge from underlying network. The final part, um, uh, I show an example where nonlinear neurodynamics are sometimes solvable. Um, and uh, the mean field theory was used to derive a closed form equation for key activity statistics. 
the network can exhibit irregular autonomous neurodynamics. Um, and uh, in the final part, uh, I explain such spontaneous activity can uh, inference neuroinformation coding. Thank you very much.